nothing about love and metro. <laughs> So again, um, the Office of Emergency Management is just crucial, critical on every incident, every call. Uh, our, we got a dispatch center that operates 24 hours, and their job is a little bit, if you look at 911, 911 is when you call 911, it's an incident that takes place and you need immediate action right then and there, fire or PD. Uh, but if that incident that you get to uh, happens to be, um, is elongated, for instance, uh, we may have an overturned tanker, uh, you may have an a, a apartment fire. Once 911 gets all the um, uh, teams or all the, all the people that need to be on the scene there, then the dispatch from OEM monitors that scene and then they constantly listen to what they need. So again, this is a resource gatherer, that's what we do. So our request today is before you, 
um, and we stayed in the same uh, um, nature that we had with everyone else. These are critical, we gotta have right now, uh, ask. Um, you guys are very graceful and understood the fire department's uh, issue with their light fleet. It's the same with OEM again. So if you look at it, the total is right up under a million. It's uh, 9965. And what we're asking for, again, we our UTVs, uh, and these UTVs, UTVs are used, uh, again, when we start talking about the homeless, going to greenways and going and getting access in and out of congested areas, um, and especially when you start talking about COVID um, and being able to keep uh, as less people um, that need to be on that incident away from it. This is just a good way of doing it. Um, our trucks that we're asking for is, just, is six. Um, and then the SUVs, um, there are actually five of those. And then our diver trucks are three. Um, all of these vehicles are similar to, as a matter of fact, not similar, they're exactly identical to what we do with fire. Again, it's able to uh, have two people there. Uh, it cuts down on the um, being in that apparatus, the enclosed apparatus with more than just two people, and this will be able to uh, be used uh, to be into congested areas and also into areas that where the terrain is difficult for personnel to, um, to, um, to be able to to get to a individual via foot, um, then the um, then the mobile webinar and camera and speaker screen. This is very critical. What we found out in the uh, EOC, the the uh, emergency operating uh, operation center, what we call the war room, uh, we had so many. Uh, it, it was a challenging because when COVID first started, of course, uh, before we realized uh, how it was passed, you know, we weren't wearing masks, um, but we were talking about hygiene and, and, um, um, and then all of a sudden we start talking about the T's and we start talking about wearing masks. So trying to keep social distancing uh, and then having the correct amount of people in that room in order to accomplish whatever task that we had, um, we, were, we, were, we, were, we had to spread out um, the personnel in order to uh, disseminate information. This mobile webinar will actually give us uh, exactly that ability. Uh, hopefully, in the near future, we'll have a whole new building, and that's a whole different story. Um, but it'll be able to uh, be able to accomplish this a lot easier. But if you guys have never been out there, and I'm, I know most of our council person uh, have been there, but any one of you guys are more than welcome. I'd love to give you a tour. You're, you'll see quickly just how confined that area is. So this just gives us the ability to keep social distancing and also have the correct people that we need to to get information out and disseminate it. So the ask again is 9965. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, page two. Yeah, this has a breakdown of everything I just gave you. Yeah, of the total amount. Page two on your OEM COVID response fleet technology. Are you, sorry, are you gonna go into, because I, I don't see it on the other pages, but the first page, um, the PPE, uh, I see MMPD and parks. Um, are there any other Metro departments who are requesting PPE? So I'm gonna come back to that okay. and a, broader level that's yeah. for all of the metro response oh okay. and nancy i will just real quick just because i think that the the when we talked about from oem because again we do put that um uh, all the ppe requests and all this stuff initially started with us and we disseminated all that out to all the metro departments from the courts to the police departments to parks and, and public works and so many others, um, I think it's sort of a, a brilliant plan to actually have that 10 million. And this is not my, it is, but it is not my ass today. But I'm just being over the Office of Emergency Management is very critical to have that money 
the 10 million setting there so it will be a reserve so we don't have to come back before a board or a committee if we need it we will use it because the assessment centers things of this nature who falls up under uh, my care it's in a constant um, constant need from the weather exposed exposure of the weather we have to have heaters and then it's hot we got to have you know air and we got to make sure these guys have the proper PPE not just for the assessment centers but for metro period and that's where that 10 million asked come from that we will be able to disseminate at will so I, I have two questions one can you explain the mobile webinar and what that looks like and then my second question um, you know, a lot of this it has in the description, um, picking up supplies and uh, it says homeless transport and um, is it, are these just being used to pick up supplies and move people around uh, uh, or are they also being used um, to get rid of debris? Uh, because I know that has also been a push. I, I, it's one thing for me to move debris and try and clean up a site. It's another thing to bulldoze through a site. Uh, and so I, my question is, is this to move encampments out or to clean encampments, if this would be used for that? Well, that's a great question, and I think uh, to answer that correctly, it's a little bit of all the above uh, um, because basically, first of all, the, the res response vehicles, each one of those have their unique uh, differences, but um, we deal with every aspect of any emergency that happens in this city, no matter what it is. So when you start talking about dealing with our homeless population or our most vulnerable population where it, it could be people that are exposed to the elements because of an emergency. For instance, when we had the flooding in the South, uh, it was also during the pandemic. So now we had multiple people that was exposed, uh, didn't have a place to stay, they didn't have um, we had to work through Red Cross. There's a lot of moving parts there. But in order to be able to uh, meet the resources that are needed, that means bring resources there on the scene. And also, it does mean at times uh, we're not what we would say cleaning up, like when you talk about maybe a community and we're, we're going there to clean. That's not our job. Our job is to go there to make the assessments. And if needed, uh, of course, we do whatever it takes, but these vehicles will be used just like what it is for fire when you're talking about responding to these calls, responding to these events, and absolutely, there are times when we do the cold patrol, we do the heat patrol, we do uh, uh, individuals that are injured, uh, individuals that are sick and that we cannot get to one way or the other. We use the UTVs, we use our, uh, the trucks, um, so they're, they got a multiple use. Uh, and, 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 and if you don't, I'm not, I don't want to interrupt, yeah. but I am sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, Councilman Sepulveda, if you'll notice, there is some equipment in a request further back that is much more aligned to what I think you were asking about, which is to actually Parks. clean up some of the, so they, not only for the encampments, but debris and other things. So I just, they, they are two separate requests. Yeah, they are two okay. separate requests. No, that's and these fine. are not the same types of equipment yeah. for that purpose. Did I answer? Okay. Any? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Okay. My mic is. You can hear me. Um. So she asked a question about what does it look like the mobile equipment? Webinar. Are you setting up a satellite? Um, somewhere else in the city or yes. just to get everybody out of the room? Right, absolutely. So that, that the, it, it is absolutely. What that uh, webinar, um, the, the mobile unit will do, if we were all in here, for instance, and we knew that the space wasn't appropriate for, for the amount of people, we could set it up one outside and it'd be just like a satellite. So that's what that's for, and it was very critical because when we had, and you guys remember this, I know, but for uh, almost a year, every day, we were at the EOC and we were doing uh, press release and all that, and we had to 
we had to cut down on the amount of people, but there were critical people that needed to be there, so they were having to be upstairs, but they didn't have the same, we didn't have that connection, so it made it a little difficult. And what we're trying to do is stay up with the you know, 24th uh, century, and the important thing about all these asks, we know that this COVID-19 is what we're talking about now, but, but listen, and I'm not saying this to be funny or not to scare anybody. This is just a new norm. I, I just think that moving forward, um, everything that we do now, we have to prepare ourselves for tomorrow and taking advantage of the opportunities to be better when we come through something, uh, it shows the worth of the city. And this is just bringing us up to more of the 21st. We should already have this, is what I'm saying. Thanks, Chief. Any other questions? So with the request for 996,500 on the table, I have a motion, a second. Let me do a quick. Okay. And I, and I don't want to take our agenda out of order, but I'm going to because um, we we talked about creating a plan for the way we distribute the money, and so I I wanted to see if there was an update on that because we're on the verge of. Uh, um, voting on more spending without having our plan in place. And I understand that there's emergency needs. And so I just wanna make sure that we have some guidance as to an update on what that looks like before we So we vote. did share the, the plan with the guiding principles that had the approximate amount kind of in high level areas at the last meeting. So it had kind of the guiding principles of how we would look at this first tranche with that first item of being the emergency response and needs. We, we said that we were gonna talk about putting it on Hub Nashville to get input from the community. Um, yes, we, we still plan for community input when we start really getting into the crux of the community dollars. And while these dollars serve the community different than bringing in specific programs okay. of economic support or other types of, you know, our different equity and um, behavioral health or, you know, those kinds of what I think of as more programming for the community. That was where we wanted to make sure we had community input before we went there. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let me do a quick vote then. Um, we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor? Aye. All right. Uh, Margaret, is that fine that we're doing voice vote or do you want me to do a roll call? Voice vote is fine. Okay. All right, you have made the recommendation for 996,500 for OEM for the items listed here. Um, I can come back to the city's emergency response. I was gonna let that go last, just so that I know we have folks here that I wanna make sure get through. So we'll move on to social services then. Um, we have Renee Pratt and Judy Tackett. Thank you um, guys. Thank you, Chief. Um, with social services, including a lot of our um, homeless initiatives through the Metro Homeless Impact Division. Thank you all for being here. Um, I guess from having all of the information ahead of time, are there any questions or would you like our group to just give you a high level okay. overview or did you have questions? Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, we do have a pretty robust request, but they're well thought out issues and items that we need as it relates to homelessness and nutrition. I'm gonna speak to nutrition and Judy Tackett's gonna to speak to the homelessness request. We run the largest Meals on Wheels program here in the city, Metro Social Services. We go from county line to county line. Um, we, are, um, we receive funding from Greater Nashville Regional Council for our nutrition program, and they were fortunate enough to receive CARES funding where we could increase meals for the seniors and for disabled people. 
we were able to increase our meals by 335,000 since we received the funding. Generally, um, a senior or disabled person receives one meal a day. It might not be a hot meal. It could be a frozen meal that they put into the microwave and that's all they receive for that day. With the additional funding, we were able to provide a hot meal and an additional frozen meal per day. So that means they're getting three meals per day, five days a week. So with that, we did not increase um, our employee count. We did not increase our vehicles. We just did it out of our current funding that we have because we couldn't ask for a position with the CARES funding through Greater Nashville Regional Council. So that's why we're requesting an additional van, not a person, just a van, to assist us with delivering meals. At this point, we only have two routes that run, an average of about 60 people per day on each route. The van will enable us to, additional, to expand meals with the additional hot route meals, and that way we can continue providing the service with the CARES Act funding. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing us to present. Uh, I would like to start with a big overview of where we are with homelessness and what this, and, and kind of give a framework for what these requests are about. Um, outdoor homelessness has definitely increased significantly. People have moved through COVID, during COVID, from shelter settings to outdoor settings. Um, there have been a lot of um, f uh, funding through the CARES Act, through the Department of Housing and Urban Development to communities. These funds last year especially have been focused on programs that are uh, managed and distributed to nonprofits uh, uh, through MDHA. So one of the things, the, the focus, I, I really want to distinguish what our asks are in, in relation to these CARES Act and also some of the ARP funds that uh, MDHA is receiving. MDHA is really focused on the permanent housing, the creation of affordable housing, and, and the support services that need to go with the housing. That is the main focus there. Another thing that we were successful, and we're working very closely with MDHA and the mayor's office and, and a leadership team, what we were really successful is to receive technical assistance, a consultant through uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, one through these CARE Act dollars with really the focus of how do we get people quickly into permanent situation that's the best COVID response for isolation, getting people indoors. So you have heard a lot over the past years, or if you, you may have heard, um, about rapid rehousing programs. And there was a goal that we set with as a community to house uh, 400 people on top of the regular housing efforts that are ongoing through these COVID acts. The goal was to house 400 people by December 2021. In July, we had uh, reached that goal and um, with community input, actually expanded it to uh, look at housing 200 more by January. Um, as of this Monday, we are at um, 550 people that moved into permanent housing. That's for rapid rehousing. That's uh, um, up to two years of rental assistance during, initially it was up to one year, but HUD actually waived it. It's up to two years. Uh, programs can go up uh, that much, plus uh, support services. Now, there is also ARP fund through MDHA that pay for uh, sustainability. So there is an additional uh, 198 um, emergency uh, uh, housing vouchers that MDHA received. And um, those are ongoing dollars that allow us to use the rapid rehousing as kind of this bridge housing. And then the people that really need that ongoing subsidies, that gives time for the support services to, to get people into ongoing um, dollars uh, through emergency housing vouchers. We have a partnership for Section 8 set-asides, uh, eight, up to 18 um, of these of Section 8 vouchers, regular Section 8 vouchers, mainstream vouchers um, that are designated for homelessness. So all of this is to framework that a lot of these CARES Act dollars um, and other pool is um, uh, the home program, home investment partnership program which uh, MDHA has received um, 
and they are working with, and that's for acquisition, creation of uh, affordable housing, the ha and, and uh, again, permanent housing creation. Now, where we come in and what our requests are is really looking at that emergency and how access to the housing. What does that look like? What's that emergency that we are seeing across the city that has increased that's outdoor homelessness? And what our, that's kind of where, where the funding is right now. We have received additional HUD technical assistance just for that emergency approach and uh, have been and are working with, with um, the consultants and the community on that as well. So going through those requests is one is a flex team. One of the things that also that you know is um, Metro is receiving the um, constituent concerns. We need to be the ones that respond. We are also set up to be the ones to really coordinate with other departments and be that coordinator. Um, we have, uh, thanks to Metro Council and Mayor's office, received um, a, a team that actually is housed with, uh, uh, within the Homeless Impact Division and Outreach Team, this FLEX team would actually support that. The FLEX team right now, we actually, through Health Department grant, uh, hired some temps uh, for members for that FLEX team already, but that fund is really, really restrictive to just COVID. Uh, we, we're really looking at... Um, uh, vaccination push, testing push uh, in encampments, um, and, and, and these type of supports that are really specifically COVID. It's a six month restriction. We believe with the increase we've seen in outdoor homelessness, um, that a temporary flex team that is actually um, granted out and has an RFP involved to a nonprofit will actually supplement what we're doing here. And one of the things we also found, there is more outreach uh, with nonprofits as well, but the coordination is important. If you, especially in street outreach, do not coordinate amongst each other and with the community and increase, and right now we are at that point where we have, we, we, we're doing really, I mean, increase the coordination also within the mentor departments. That's where we need to be and really get those numbers down. So one of the things, for, for these requests is, if this works, we will not need ongoing funding. So, if, you know, because we already have some of the key pieces in place, but for, for this extra really push, that's what this, these requests are for. Um, there is, I'm going to share with you, yesterday I looked how many people are on the list of people who passed away experiencing homelessness. As of yesterday, and um, it's 130 people for this calendar year. This morning we had a meeting where 30 names were read for the last months that made it on that list. Homelessness is a crisis. Homelessness is lethal. We need to do something now. We have the funding to do something now. Nationwide, I've also looked at, because there's always concerns about ongoing funding, and now we do all that. Um, we need to use the funds that we have right now and invest them for the most vulnerable people and it saves lives. It, it increases the quality of life of, for all of us. The transportation grant is really focused on that, uh, getting people to emergency shelters, getting people to uh, a big theme every year is the cold weather overflow shelter. What we've seen this year is a lot of flooding uh, where people were displaced. We've used, uh, scrambled to use motels and what can we do to help? Um, this is really the coordinated approach with, we, we worked with the transportation grant uh, seeking input with, uh, from WeGo because they are very supportive of what we're doing with ongoing. Again, this is kind of the supplemental. If there are more people being outdoors, then we need to expect more people coming indoors when, when these crises happen. So we need this additional dollars there. That's also um, on, on the uh, proposal for the emergency shelter cost. This is really looking at some of these shelters, maybe when it, when it was 20 um, flooding, for example, it would be 24 seven for a few days. We had um, increased length of stays in winter shelter that because the um, temperatures were so cold and so much colder for uh, 24 seven that we expanded these. Um, 
that's kind of uh, where we're looking with what are the needs to increase the bed capacity. Metro has been dying, the done, the Metro has been providing winter sheltering and overflow sheltering for a few years, and we continue to do that. But again, we anticipate there is an increase in need in, in, in that um, this winter with this increase in population that we see outdoors. There are more people that will need to do that. And then the other um, weather related events are just increasing. Um, you see also a request for expanding the SOAR contract with Park Center. We have already at the Metro Homeless Impact Division a SOAR um, program that is in essence linking people with SSI income. Our program here with the contract with Park Center is actually one of the that's the program nationwide that other cities are looking to because um, it, it's a best practice model and it's really, really well implemented. Um, this is the only program I, I want to be transparent about that I would, if this, if we see pushing this out to people in encampments, if this works, that's something that I would, I would really, really push for um, ongoing because that links people to income. Income is needed if you actually want um, sustainable housing and access to housing. Um, this is kind of something that that um, we can be proud of of what we have, but we need more of. And then the sanitation stations contract request. So during COVID, at the height of COVID, uh, we placed um, our city placed sanitation stations, that's porta potties and hand washing stations in areas, especially during the shutdown. We had about a dozen of those in different places where people frequented, so they had access to these sanitation stations. We have reduced those significantly uh, once the city opened back up, but we are still not at the end of COVID. So there are right now four locations that this would be ongoing um, dollars to, to sustain those until we are a little bit further out of, you know, or until we're out of the COVID crisis. So with that, um, that's kind of the summary that I wanted to provide. All right, let's, I gotta get this right. All right. Thank you, I have several questions. Uh, f this flex team, $240,000 of an ask, you have salaries at $195,000, which is based on $40,000 per person plus fringe for four benefits. 40,000 times four is 160. So you're looking at $40,000 in fringe benefits for the four pe people? That, or sorry, 35. Yes, and this, this was... Okay, yeah. did the fringe benefits, is that, are you detailing it out underneath there where it says mileage, parking, workers comp, technology, all of that, or is that in addition to what you're calling fringe benefits and can you define fringe benefits? Uh, fringe benefits for, for this um, is kind of the, um, let me see real quickly. The Pension, insurance, the, that type of coverage. Yeah, the health. Because, you know, your health, your medical, things like that, that type of fringe so, benefits. And all the payroll taxes. Right, and all that. So it doesn't include those administrative expenses right below where it says cost. Okay, yeah. so 195 plus 22.4 does not equal 240. The, so, the last item for the miscellaneous expenses is 12.6. I left that out. So you've got a total of 45,000 on administrative expenses and 195 on comp and benefits. Okay. 240. Um, the technology supplies for $8,000, and I know I'm getting nitpicky, but don't we have some laptops and cell phones and hotspots that MNPS is not using currently? I know I've gotten some things for codes employees that MNPS is not using currently, and so that was a, a savings for them um, from the last CARES Act allocation for those laptops and hotspots. So I was just wondering if we could not duplicate that. Well, we can ask. We don't typically use MNPS assets. Codes didn't have a problem, but um, just there's no reason to have laptops or hotspots sitting around if we've already paid for them. It just seems silly to have those sitting down. Um, the emergency shelter calls for $375,000. Is this a duplication? Because on the first page we have um, for the emo emergency response, I'm assuming for Metro, a lot of that um, is in the reserve fund for homeless emergency um, COVID shelters and related expenses. Is that 
uh, would that one, not be in the 10 million reserve fund that they're going to be asking for? Uh, this one is um, the operational, the staffing cost for uh, Metro Social Services additional, if, if additional beds are opened. So at this point, that wouldn't be included. No, Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question, though, on the, the 375. Yes, let me get... Councilmember Gamble. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'm Councilmember Jennifer Gamble, and I just want to publicly say thank you. You all have always been very responsive and helpful in regards to assisting homeless uh, encampments in, our, in, in, in my district specifically, specifically, but throughout the city. And this um, proposal is a good, good uh, photo image of what, what the needs are in the city as we, as you express, we continue to have um, more homeless individuals, particularly during this pandemic. You mentioned, oh, so I can't remember which one, said something about 550 people. Is that how many you're serving now or how many you expect uh, to serve with this funding? That is how many uh, we are serving now through the CARES Act, through yeah. the MDHA CARES Act, that, that MDHA has received, yes. Do you have any idea of how many more individuals you'll be able to, to serve with this additional funding? So with this street outreach, so that one is for permanent housing. Okay. Um, so one of the things we're looking at and what I calculated, this is about access to housing. So I look at what vouchers are still there that we actually could utilize, which is um, 198 in vouchers that MDHA has received. So that's 198 people. Right now we have actually, by the way, uh, the 550 people, 90% are from the outdoor population. So that is a big focus. So 198 uh, of these vouchers plus uh, 216 a year, up to 216 a year in Section 8 vouchers through another partnership that we have ongoing. So looking at that, that's how um, I'm calculating and we really need to focus on that, on that permanent housing. I did not calculate in that some additional rapid rehousing dollars that are still not being spent and that the nonprofits are working on and, and spending it on, down. So does this include then uh, the partnerships you have with churches, with Room in the Inn? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and it's partnerships. Um, some, some of our partners, I'm just... and. I'm not going to list every single one because right. I won't remember, but it's the Salvation Army, right. Mental Health Co-op, right. Room in the Inn, the Mission, um, the Contributor, uh, Park Center, uh, Operation Stand, Down Tennessee, uh, and on and on and on. So it's really anybody so it's, who's homelessness and safe haven, like also families in, included in that, yes. So is there any funding in this proposal to support those programs? Because I, I know there's a lot of need there as well, so I'm wondering if, if we need to add something. But, or do you think that this will uh, support so those if additional you look at some of the additional needs where I see the biggest lack is the, the, the um, intensive support services for the for some of those vouchers, mm -hmm. especially the 216 Section 8 vouchers ongoing. There is some, but not as intense and as, as there is some lack of funding there. And how much uh, would um, you... So per person, I would say a very intense um, uh, annual support um, team, let's let's say let's say average. I don't want to, you right. know. Um, uh, and uh, it's it's about four to five thousand per person. Okay. Okay. And naturally, that's what you have here in the proposal. So about four to five thousand mm -hmm. per person mm -hmm. uh, for those uh, vouchers. Yes, for the support services. Support services the, to okay. ongoing supports that really um, look at what the people need to get to that sustainability. And, uh, you know, and not everybody will always be at that sustainability. Right. And again, these are one-time funds, but we can really look at what works, what doesn't work. And, and it buys us some, some time for additional resources to look at uh, ongoing support services at federal, state, and every resource there is to... Okay, continue. so there are other areas that you can look at or other funding sources that you can right look now, at. Right now, everything is uh, being utilized, but in an ongoing basis, I believe um, 
we lack in the state, <laughs> frankly, some funding, but this could make a case on where we, if we want to sustain this, right, if we want right. to keep people in, right. we really need to do that um, data-driven approach okay. and performance measures right. to make the case to some of the funding sources. Now, oh. one of the examples that works really well with the state level is around family homelessness. When you look at that and tenant funds and how they are being used and how actually even around homelessness with a regional approach. So um, our chance is to look at, look, here's what we need. Right. Here's what other cities need. Um, I'm already in touch with some of the other larger cities, Chattanooga, Knoxville, um, and, and Memphis, to see how we can actually learn from each other what we're doing and how we can actually, if you will, bend together for some of these. So this funding would also help leverage additional opportunities yes. with state and federal. Thank yes. you. Question. Um, so you had four people on the flex team in terms of staffing, and you laid out the health insurance costs and whatever the administrative cost is for that staff. So on this pilot, to uh, help folks um, to access their SSI, and um, my question is, are these people not being, is there no benefits associated with with these positions, or uh, are they just contract positions for? So uh, the ones on uh, the flex team would be a contract position, and RFP, a nonprofit, would, um, you know, RFP up for a nonprofit and contract position uh, with that. But the uh, um, SOAR, that's an established grant that we have, it would expand it. Um, it's based on their salary that they're already doing. They, they gave me, I, I requested what would you need to actually expand this term, you know, in, into the, and really focus on um, the outreach population. And so that's what, what, how they listed it, yeah. And the SOAR specialists are very specialized tasks. It's not, it's an intensive training on how to do it and really get those numbers to sort down. And just to give you a comparison, I looked up the average um, days to award for the last three year was about 80 days. Whereas if you compare that, if an attorney does it, which traditionally, you know, has been done, it's about two years. That's how much quicker this program works. Okay, we've got a couple more. Sean, go ahead. Hold on, let me get your mic. Well, first, just thank you for what you guys do and how you go about your, your business. It's incredible. Uh, I have a question on the salaries, though, for the Flex team. Mm -hmm. What happens a year from now? We're going to fund these for a year, these four positions. Yeah. Will yeah. this fold into your normal budget, or do we have to look at incremental funding as we did with, I forget what the other grant was, or I thought we did two years of salary cycles? Yeah. Because, unfortunately, the population you serve will suffer COVID much longer than the rest of the community. So don't you need positions on an ongoing basis? One of the um, one of the things how we're thinking about it is the current COVID crisis. So there is, and it's really this establishing the bones, if you will. We need expanding our team that we have right now. Our team, which is also pretty new, is is already in the major budget for four members there is a bigger need right now. So this and these, the, the people know, this is a one time, one year, that's where we're looking at, you know, where we are. And my thinking is if this works, we're gonna see numbers go down, the coordination is gonna be better, we have this foundation in place. And uh, we're leveraging then with the partners what we have, and that's the goal with that. Uh, if that happens, then do we need it? On and on, you know, that's that's where that request is coming from. Thanks. Oh, Councilwoman Poldova, sorry, and then I'll come back to you. Um, thank you, and and, and I echo the sentiments of uh, my colleagues on the committee. Thank you for everything you do. I. I know that a lot of people don't see behind the scenes and don't see the other partners that are working closely together with y'all. Um, but I have I have two questions. Um, I, I really do uh, appreciate the four pickup pick routes uh, as far as the shelters go. 
Um, I had a question whether those locations have been identified, and if um, so, what, what they are? Yeah, so we look, at, not uh, per address, but southeast, uh, um, west, kind of <laughs> the geographic areas. And then we're looking at um, Walmart parking lots. That's usually in uh, areas where a lot of people uh, experiencing homelessness. You know, there's a bus stop there. There's ways to hurt it. Uh, they're mobile towards that. So kind of that type of, we are identifying it that way. Great. And then my second question uh, was for the meal deliveries. Um, where, I, I wanted to share that information. So other uh, seniors in, in the area would know about it if they don't. How do you sign up for that? We have a nutrition line that they can call and sign up. Usually they have to be referred by a doctor or a, physici a physician or a nurse or a social worker for the meals. Um, so we have a regular nutrition program they could qualify for. So this isn't just special because of CARES. We run the, run the nutrition program for the city. So there's a call, they can call the line. If they get the referral, then we can sign them up for meals. Can, can someone share that? I'll send it out to Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Renee, if you want to send that, I can send it to the okay, whole committee. I'll send it to and, everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for waiting. I know you are on a short time frame. Yeah, I've got three minutes to make my point. Uh, our question. <laughs> uh, so first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you for what you do, Renee. It's great to see you. It's been a few years. Um, um, I, I, one question, and that's probably a Mayor Joe question, is like the MDHA, the ARP money, how does that flow to them? That's, that has obviously nothing to do with this, but how does it flow? How does, where does that money come from? Uh, Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. So it goes from HUD yeah, so directly the HUD, to them. Okay. Yeah, the HUD money, um, while it serves Metro, long ago Metro kind of contracted with MDHA to manage those funds. And so a lot of the work that Judy has been referring to has been funded through CDBG funds that were received through, from HUD through the CARES Act and working with MDHA. And we had significant funding that we actually had a HUD technical specialist who's been working with our homeless group. Yeah, I picked up, yeah, that, that's good. All right, that, that helps me see the kind of the flow and understand yeah. the, the, the real pur purposeful intent of this dollars that it's sort of the last dollar from everything else yes. that is flowing. So I, I get that. Yeah, we very specifically mm -hmm. tried to optimize what dollars could be used for once we get into an area that maybe those CDBG funds don't fund or are now used, we start to layer in the other uses. Yeah, that, that, make, that makes, makes perfect sense. My other one, I'm gonna to try to, to see if I can put my thoughts together and it's piggybacking on what someone was saying. And that is the intentionality of this money, right? And, and, and how, and, and I don't expect that, w that you guys will have an answer, but it's just, I just wanna elevate that conversation about what I've heard of the, this is a one-time thing. And so how, like what work is happening before these requests are coming to us to make sure that those conversations with the different agencies are being had about not, not incorporating or, or preparing the proposals in a way that there's not, that, that that issue is addressed. The issue being what's going to happen a year from now yeah. Uh, and 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 not setting ourselves in a situation where a year from now we we're all of a sudden looking for twenty five million dollars because we funded all. I'm exaggerating, right? But mm -hmm. but how how is that piece of the, this this money being managed, communicated, and 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 looked after from a, from a just the the work that you guys are doing, the 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 the, the um, departments are doing, so that it does. It, it sets us, this committee, for success as well. I don't know if that yeah. makes Oh, it does, because the majority of our, really our purpose as the Homeless Impact Division, the majority of our work is in planning and coordination and coordinating these communications, who's getting what, who's covering what, how does it fit together, and deduplicating services. We are the lead of a homeless management information system, a database that really is used uh, by the community and community providers and partners that helps deduplicate duplicate who's working with whom and who's doing what and which pieces. We have um, a regular, right now every two weeks, um, 
different groups, meaning the ones that provide uh, uh, housing supports, to really communicate with the frontline staff and then also at the supervisor level of who's doing what, what are the questions, where, where are you? Uh, we have a every two weeks a outreach coordination meeting, one was today with all the frontline staff. So who's doing the outreach where, what are the hotspots, if you will, uh, where is the housing navigation going on? So it's really from the frontline staff to the um, some of the decision makers that, that um, go for the funds to also have the planning uh, coordinated who's going for which funding so that it supplements each other. Those are ongoing conversations. Um, I uh, speak to HUT regularly on um, what we can do better, what not, bringing them in if we need to, to actually, um, sometimes you can elevate the conversation or bring it back to another focus when you have somebody from outside coming in, you know, and especially when they're sent from HUD, where the money is coming from. So we really uh, do that hand in hand and, and have these coordination. It's, it's an ongoing effort. I think we think of the expenses in two ways as um, catching up on backlog. You heard a lot about that with Office of Family Safety and some of the um, backlog and client weights. I think another way to present these expenses are they're almost like startup. Like we really have to build the foundation, build the system, build the infrastructure, and then once, and that takes more time and expense to get that going, but then it becomes a manageable process within our regular budget. So a lot of the uses that we've talked with departments, we've emphasized with them, these cannot become part of your recurring operating budgets. They can't be something that then at the end of these dollars, we suddenly have, have gaps to fill. So we've emphasized to them that if this is a backlog and we're catching up, that's a, that's a proper use as long as it fits the other eligibility. And then also if it's, well, it's gonna take some startup to get it going, but then I can manage it within my operating budget. That resonates with like this notion of startup, yep. fun, get it going, but yeah. And I think that, and not that's to put words in Judy's mouth, sure. but that's what I was. That's, <laughs> that's it, and that's also the message from the federal government and from uh, national providers and national level conversations that we're participating in. Is these are one-time dollars. Use them now because people are dying out there. You use them. You get more people into housing. Use them while you have it. Yes, think long term, but don't get stuck with you're not going to have it and not do something you know, right now when you have the opportunity to build that foundation and system. I, um, well, but he's here, so there's quorum. I, I, we don't have to take a vote on this. If I could crux a vote for this vote, good, if not. Are we, are there any other questions before Jose has to leave? Since he was here, he can vote. I heard him move to approval. Uh, Councilwoman Gamble second, all in favor? Thank you all. Yes. Can, I, uh, can you? Council level. Yes. Yes. Thank you, ladies. Safe travels, Jose. <laughs> okay. Um, I am afraid, Director Odom, if, if I may ask if Kristen goes, I'm afraid I'm gonna lose her. <laughs> we did this to her last meeting. So we're skipping ahead to page eight on the um, department requests. This is the one that had a bit of an update, which is why I gave you the hard copy. If you're following on the um, electronic, you'll be just fine. We've just reduced it from four positions to three positions. Not, not tough to follow, just wanted to give you the updates. Yes, thanks Mary Jo, and I'm sorry, I. Uh do a weekly meeting with Judge Calloway to work on the Juvenile Justice Center and a lo new location for it. And that's at 4.30, that's why I ran it last. It's council's number one priority and trust me, we are, we are working, she'll tell you, we are working about as hard as she's ever seen on that. Um, 
we have an opportunity. The only reason this is before you right now is time. Um, otherwise, I probably would have delayed it until we had gotten through some more conversations about economic recovery and affordable housing because those are themes in here. Um, but uh, this is a, a national um, fellowship opportunity that's come our way to pursue with an organization called Fuse Corps, and they run on an annual cycle that starts in November. So, um, so if we choose not to do this, we'll, we'll miss the cycle. And that's why I'm in front of you today to consider this. And it is your consideration. Um, Fuse Corps is a national philanthropy. They've been around for over a decade. They work with cities and they bring forward usually fellows, executives who have somewhere between at least 15 on average 20 years of experience in a field who then go and partner in with cities and work on major civic problems. They have a special initiative right now that they've started that's around equity and equitable recovery. And as a result, they've always required a match, but they've actually reduced the match substantially um, for us. And so it costs us around 45K for a fellow. Um, uh, we get to pick the problems we wanted to work on. We figured we could start off with three areas that are really around some recovery work. And if we like them, we can look at them next year too. So this is a little bit of a trial to it. The areas we had conversations with were around affordable housing, and we would look at having a fellow join the planning team where council has assigned two new positions in this last budget, as well as some strategic planning funds to help with the policy and strategy work there. We would, and so we would report into planning. Um, we would have a fellow who works with um, uh, the mayor's office and NASA on after school programs, really looking for ways for us to define the landscape of the programs that are out there, but then develop a strategy for how those programs can be more equitable, more accessible, and really fuel some of the recovery that we need to do with our kids and our communities today. And then lastly, um, we'd be looking at having a fellow work with myself and Chief Swan. Um, we've talked about co-owning it to work on what we're calling resilience, but I actually think that word is so broad what we're gonna have them do is focus on vulnerable and minority populations. And the um, last seven disasters we've had over the last period of time, help us pull all the insights we need to from an equity lens out of the after action reports and define an action plan for us to help think further, not just about homelessness, so the homelessness has certainly been a population we've struggled with, but the vulnerable elderly, the disabled, immigrant communities, what do we need to do to actually put um, a, a better structure both in our planning for emergencies, our response to emergencies, and then kind of our ongoing kind of net behind after that um, for these communities to be able to recover better. So this is the three areas that we'd be looking at having fellows. Again, they'd be about 45K each for the contract itself. It would be a nonprofit contract for council members that we would need to take through. It's a match. They actually said it costs them well over a couple hundred thousand dollars all in for each individual one, but this gets skin in the game from us so that we're serious about our commitment too. And then we added a, another 5K on top just for, we're gonna have to provision laptops because we're not a bring your own device kind of, our cybersecurity rules don't allow that. So we'll have to give them a little bit of equipment too. So the total all in would be 150K and out of that, um, 135K would go through a nonprofit contract with Fuse Corps if we wanted to do this. And then another 15K would be available for equipment and ancillary costs. And only as incurred, we might not use all of that. Thoughts or questions? Yes. Okay. Um, so I just had a couple of questions. Um, would the fellows be working under uh, the equity uh, position in the finance office, uh, the new person we have hired? Well, I think they've been there for a year or so. Would it be under that person or different departments, depending? Um, where we've aligned them, they would work closely with Andrea Blackman, I think is who you're, who you're yes. referring to. And technically they're employees of Fuse Corps. So this is a fellowship. Fuse okay. Corps gives them their benefits and things like that. But the places where we were talking about putting up desks for them, let's say, right, is that um, after school would be a combination of the mayor's education policy advisor, which is an open position, but we're actively looking to backfill Robert Fisher 
that role plus NASA. So okay. they're gonna have touchdown space actually out with the library um, team at NASA, the after school program. Okay. Then uh, same thing for resilience would be with the mayor's office, but also touchdown space over at OEM, with Chief Swan's team. And then finally the um, planning uh, position for affordable housing would be with the planning team. But Andrea Blackman will be involved with all of Great. them. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I, I just wanna make sure that happens since we specifically fund this and if the fellows go away, I still want her to have the access to all of the information. So that's great to hear. Um, I also really do appreciate um, the the NASA aspect of this and the after school programs. I was on the special committee where council member uh, Gamble actually was the chair of that special committee for after school programming. And I know that there were some gaps uh, people wanted to fill. Um, so I, I really do appreciate the equity lens of this all. Um, and this program is for how long? One year. One year. Okay. And Great. then again, if we find it to be compelling, we have the opportunity next year, we could take another look at it and again, come up with further priorities or further opportunities as well. Other questions? Yeah. Member. Thank you for bringing this to us and, and uh, council member support for the express my sentiments exactly uh, where this is a benefit to our city. The one year time frame. when would that start? It would start in November once council authorizes it. We're, okay. we're kind of up against the gun for their annual cycle, okay. but they know does not move forward unless council ultimately authorizes it. And this is this the total funding? Is there any matches or anything coming from any other funding sources needed for this? So this is a, a match versus funding that they bring from their philanthropic okay. arm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I got to figure out where you are. You nod. Thank you, I, I just want to thank you again for bringing this. It's a great idea. Just curious with respect to the uh, selection process for the actual fellows, yeah, how that, question. what that looks like. So um, they go through a vetting process themselves and they bring three candidates forward for each role. And then uh, the various departments that are involved are involved in the interviewing and the selection process of finalists. So we've had those interviews already underway. We have um, a great little crop here of people if we wanna move forward. If not, like I said, there's no, there's no risk right now on Metro. Great. Representative Love, I think you had a question too. Thank you. And I may have missed it. Mm -hmm. The one year time frame would start when? In November, upon just, council authorization. All right. And, and is it possible, I'd be interested in it, is it possible to add, though we might be disbanded by that time, uh, a report to the members of this committee on the progress? Absolutely. And you will not, I think in a year you won't be for sure, but we could, <laughs> that, we could that was such wishful if, thinking on I your was, part. <laughs> if you would like what we could I even. I was just praying do. hard. That maybe, <laughs> so. I, I mean, I think we're pretty excited about this. If you would like, we could even look at the six, six month mark, for example, to bring them in and let you meet them and understand what they're working on and what they've learned so far. I think that would certainly be something that could be interesting. And that way you'll have a hand in, shaping it further if you think that there's something they're missing or there's um, opportunity to shape where their recommendations go. Would that, yeah. would that make sense? A year is fine, but six months would, would work, but I really would mm -hmm. just want, be interested in what their findings would be, particularly when we're talking about issues that uh, seemingly various other entities are trying to approach and deal with around affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Of course, the long-term disaster piece and this issue of after school learning and expanding of that, uh, particularly as we see the state possibly still, well, we, we've budgeted two years of after school funding and summer school. So we'll go into next year's summer also, Great. just but just to see how we could possibly expand that, that may give us insight for other budget years and see what we can do. Yeah, and Representative Love, you raise a great question on the reporting side, which this committee has always been very thoughtful about. And a, some of the items that we've already made recommendations for today are purchases, which don't really require a report. You already know what you're getting. But we do have other things like within our social services program about serving um, populations. And I would 
um, as we work on the resolution, we haven't really talked about the resolutions yet, but just to jump ahead a little bit, the recommendations you're making, we will draft resolutions and then submit, you know, then have them circulated for just to make sure that you all agree. If we need to do any working, I would probably then work with the sponsor to make sure that we get that wording right. But we, as we have in all of our um, kind of programs and service delivery, we will request um, the, the quarterly reporting so that they're reporting back to us demographics. So not only in this work, but just to reiterate, that's an important piece of all the work that will come through the resolutions. But I'd recommend maybe a quarterly report, but also physically, we could have them come and do an update for you all at that six month mark. I think that would, that would be, I think something they'd really look forward to. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, I have a motion to approve the funding. Here a second, all in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you all. Now, um, I'm assuming we're going back to homelessness and parks, and so. Yes, to sorry to switch topics, and thank you. <laughs> Just so that Kristen can leave on time. <laughs> Not that we're getting rid of you, Kristen. <laughs> Director Odom, thank you. We, let me get everybody back to the right page. Picking up now on page six with parks. And as we said, this really is a piggyback off of the um, homeless um, encampment issues that we've been having. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be before you today. I am Monique Horton Odom, Director of Metro Parks and Recreation. And so I will, I feel like I know some of you, but I uh, also want to let you know a little bit about Metro Parks. We span the entire, um, entire county. We have over 16,000 acres of parkland, 178 parks, seven golf courses, four nature centers, 29 community centers, um, Hamilton Creek Marina, the Parthenon Ascend Amphitheater. Um, and so my request today is um, of $1,933,000, and it folds into uh, some of the uh, requests and remarks that have been made earlier, both by uh, Chief Swan and the team from Social Services. As you um, have already acknowledged this afternoon, and it is very evident in the park system that our homelessness um, population has increased exponentially. And again, it is very evident on parks and greenways. Um, and so my ask today is uh, broken up into uh, kind of three sections. Um, the first one is equipment. Um, and it's some heavy equipment and then some um, smaller items to assist our custodial and grounds maintenance team with um, clearing encampments. Um, I'll, I'll roll back just a little bit and let you know that we are part of um, Metro's coordinated response to homelessness. Um, given that um, many displaced residents are, are um, encamped in uh, public spaces, mo a lot of them are on parks and greenways. We are included in that response and work uh, collaboratively with um, social services, the police department and the mayor's office and other um, community organizations. So uh, going back to the ask, uh, we have some heavy equipment ask, um, you know, a bob a bobcats and many ex excavators to um, clean up uh, debris and remove um, trash, of course, trash trucks. Um, and this is um, in addition to our fleet. Now we have a small fleet and then our um, annual fleet request through Metro can be unpredictable. And these are um, one-time asks and one-time funding requests. So they fit nicely within the parameters uh, of, of this grant, of, of this funding. Then we're asking, asking for portable lighting and pressure washer rigs. Again, homelessness is just across this county. Um, in every, well, I won't say every park, but almost every park in Greenway, uh, from picnic shelters to, um, you know, again, Greenway trailheads. And then particularly when we um, have Greenways or parks that are in, d that there's dense um, coverage of uh, plant material and or trees, um, the, the encampments are there. And when, you know, we are working to 
um, assist with removal um, once folks have been housed or removed. Um, it's a lot of work for our team. We typically have to um, rent uh, heavy equipment to get, to get it cleaned out. Um, and then our second, um, second part of the request are for Eye in the Sky cameras. We do have a contract with Eye in the Sky through Metro Police where we um, have cameras at uh, parks and parks facilities. This request um, in particular is for um, locations where we have had homelessness, instances of homelessness there, either in the past or currently. Um, and either we have coverage there or need more coverage. And then the final piece is um, a capital project. Um, I am certain all of you may have, well, you may have um, heard a lot about the Brookmead Park and Greenway, where there is uh, a significant homelessness, homeless encampment. Uh, we, again, have been working with our teams in Metro and in the community to work to get folks housed. But again, we are on, at parks are on, more on the response side. So we're on the cleanup side. Um, and um, the park is at this point not, not usable. It is not usable. It is quite frankly not safe. Um, and so what we are looking forward to while this funding is av available, it seems appropriate that um, we make a request to renovate that park when you know, folks are removed, uh, renovated, and uh, you know, it, from the trailhead signage, the parking lot, um, railing and demoing the current bridge that's there and, and replacing it, and then the installation of um, electronic gates at the park. So one of the issues I'll just say with, um, in respect to parks and parks facilities, is that um, we, we recognize that homelessness is a community-wide issue and parks are public spaces, and we do not criminalize homelessness. So that is one of the reasons why we are uh, very committed to working um, as a part of the Metro team and um, having a Metro response. Um, when we talk about installation of electronic gates here, what we also have found is that if there is not some sort of community solution um, when an encampment is cleaned up, um, new residents will move in if there's not a, a long-term solution. Um, that's one reason we, are, again, we are working um, with our Metro partners and, and community-wide to support um, a long-term solution. So our, again, our ask is $1,933,000. 1, $1, um, a big bulk of that is renovation of Brook, Brookmead Park, but then there are also, as you can see, um, tools for um, Park's teammates to, to be able to do the job that they need to do. So with that, uh, any questions? Councilman Spolova. Great. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I, I have a, a big issue, uh, and I think my colleagues on the council will know where I'm going with the eye on this eye in the sky cameras. Um, for those not on council, uh, we're currently going through a process on the council with license plate readers, which is a little bit different, but at the end of the day, there are, uh, different, um, uh, ways of viewing, uh, cameras around the city. Um, there our concerns about privacy for many colleagues of mine. Uh, and there are other concerns for other colleagues as far as enforcement. So it, it's a pretty split, um, it's a pretty split council on it right now. And we have uh, two LPR legislations that are coming back to the council floor. Um, so my problem with, with eye in the sky cameras, I, I understand wanting to, um, have a little bit more control. My, my initial thought is that I, I, I don't feel comfortable surveilling homeless populations. Um, it, it, 
And these cameras would be around even if there weren't homeless populations. And, and I feel like that's a very slippery slope for me. Um, I, I could get on board with the gates and trying to, you know, help mitigate things as, as far as that goes. Uh, my other concern would be, you know, and we've seen this in other parts of the city when we push out homeless uh, people into other areas, they just move on. And so we'll have this problem in other parts of town and maybe they'll end up, you know, on a street where there's uh, several businesses instead of the park. And it's an ongoing cycle and we have bigger underlining issues that have caused this, which is affordable housing. Um, but I, I guess I, I wouldn't so much be on board with eye in the sky cameras. My question is how many other parks facilities uh, have these types of cameras, who keeps the information, is there an audit process for it, how long is the data stored, if the data is stored? So there are, no, I could um, provide you a list. I, I have a, uh, get a monthly report from our IT um, internally at parks about um, cameras. We have a number of parks um, that have already have cameras, in, in fact, a lot of these already have some camera um, coverage in them. Um, and I would just say that um, they, they're not only, um, I wouldn't characterize them as just for homeless. I think they are a um, safety and security measure for the public in general, but I, I uh, totally understand what you're saying. Um, Eye in the Sky is the, uh, the company that we use through the Metro Police Department and um, we don't particularly audit um, what is on the um, on the what is captured on the video. Normally, what happens um, for parks if there is um, an incident that happens on parks property that happens to be a camera there, we move through our work through our park police and through Metro Police to pull the footage from there. So Metro Police um, has has the footage. There was a, a violent attack, and the police. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> the police uh, were able to use the footage, as the director said, um, to be able to uh, find that person. Now, you know, I think we can talk about a policy for how that would be going forward. But I can say, as a reflection of this internal working group. Uh, the director said it perfectly. There's no interest in criminalizing homelessness. Uh, the footage has not at any point in this group's work been used to track people down for, you know, being to, for living outside. Um, and so I, you know, wonder if there's an opportunity to put some um, policies around how the footage would be used. But then I also have learned um, that it has been a valuable deterrent for some of the um, activity that we saw in the parking lot. Um, that's not really um, necessarily, you know, originating from our unhoused neighbors, but, you know, is people coming to park in the parks at night, you know, of course, just by nature of them being um, often unoccupied. And so if that deterrent factor can be helpful to make sure the parks stay safe and accessible, I think that would be the goal of this. Thank you, Director. I mean, I, I, I would appreciate some data as to how many instances have been stopped and the overall crime rate uh, reported in our parks department. I, I think that's something we should have regardless. Uh, just so we have an idea um, there. I, I mean, I, I still struggle with the privacy aspect of it. I understand what we're trying to do. Sometimes I feel like it's outsourcing um, because we lack so many resources. You know, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just struggling a little bit with this.
Council Thank Member you. Campbell. Thank you, Director Odom, for coming here and presenting this today. I have two questions. The eye in the sky cameras, are they similar to the uh, MMPD blue light cameras that we have throughout the city? And, and are these cameras mostly directed toward the parking lot in the park, not necessarily where homeless are in camp? Right. They, they would, they're focused on a park right. uh, or, or a location. Okay. And so they have a, a, a coverage parameter. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't think they would necessarily be focused on a, a homeless encampment. Okay. Just keeping the overall park safe yes. for everyone. Yes. And secondly, if you could talk a little bit more about the Brookmead uh, facility, I'm not familiar and okay. uh, with this renovation capital project. Sure, sure. So the Brookmead um, Park and Greenway is in West Nashville, right off of Charlotte, if Charlotte Avenue, if you all know where the Lowe's, the, I think there's a Walmart, and then specifically a Bojangles there. The tr a trailhead for that Greenway is right there. Um, and I think Water Services is doing a project actually there at this time. Um, that, um, that's a dense, uh, a dense area with trees, a dense natural area. And uh, there is a greenway there that goes back to the, um, the Cumberland River. Um, we have seen similar to, uh, I don't know if you all can remember, similar to the encampment that was at Fort Nagley. Um, this is the, the caliber of encampment that we are seeing there. Um, again, we are partnered with the mayor's office, uh, MMPD, social services, and other uh, uh, homeless advocacy groups to try to move folks out. But, the, but again, we're on the, um, more on the response team, the cleanup side. Uh, of um, making that a park again. Um, right now, it is not safe, and we have fenced it, um, but it, it's not safe for public use. Um, and we, uh, I think uh, Judy may have, have mentioned that uh, we get a number of um, expressions of um, fear and frustration, to be quite frank. Um, from constituents who live in that area. Um, and so the hope would be for us to um, renovate that space so that the public can use it. Right now, it is not at all in condition to be, to be used. It is um, uh, our, our, my um, our custodial staff and our grounds maintenance staff, and we're, it's really all hands on deck. Um, the four or five times we have gone out over the past several years to um, clean up the encampment. I mean, it is um, large trash articles, large debris, um, you can imagine, with Lowe's and Walmart being closed. There are shopping carts, there are pa wooden pallets, and, you know, quite frankly, people are trying to survive, and we understand that. But when um, our folks are out there cleaning it up, it is really very, very labor-intensive. Um, but our goal would be to rehab that space. Um, and again, with the installation of the electronic gates, um, for me, um, you know, as I said, if we don't resolve the homelessness issue in our city, it's just going to show up. I think as someone else said it, it will show up somewhere else or they will come back to that space. And so that is what we have gotten an estimate for um, from an engineering firm of about how much it would it would be to rehab that space. And Director Odom, isn't it correct that a lot of the damage, the, the need for the renovation is oh, yeah. damage because of the encampment? And yes. It, it, and the it wouldn't just simply be to yeah. make it look prettier. It's actually it's to damage. return it to function. Right. It is so repairs, pulling, really. pulling things More repairs, out. really, it's, than... It's demolition. Renovation. And um, rebuilding is what it is. So with the electronic fence gate, yeah. is that a permanent, uh, would that be a permanent fixture? And and how would that work within the use of the public space? It would be. So um, that park and greenway, uh, the hours of that park and greenway are similar to others um, in the greenway system. If there are no lights at a park um, and no, or a greenway, the hours are dawn to dusk. And so no one should be there after that time. And so what we believe may be a deterrent um, is the installation of 
an electronic gate. And I would imagine that um, in terms of practical practicality, it may be um, automated so that, you know, some folks from my team didn't have to visit every morning and open it or lock it every night. Um, I think we have the technology now to be able to, yeah, be on a timer. So, yeah. So I have a question. There is an uh, itemized calls, Director Odom. Um, I, I respect and appreciate your work. Um, thank you for being here. There is an itemized cost for the electronic gate. So my question is, um, are, do all of the parks where you, where there's a proposal for the eye in the sky cameras already have these electronic gates? And what is the cost so that we could have some options? I can send you um, the itemized cost for um, the rehab. I do have the, the estimate here. But um, no, all locations that have cameras do not have, do not have gates. Um, say, for instance, Hadley Park or Centennial Park, they don't have gates. E either of those, um, or electronic gates, I'll say that. Hadley has one. Well, both of them do. Um, have gates that can be closed. But given, um, given the situation at Brookmead, you know, it is, um, I would say it's, it's warranted and, and justified. Hi. Hello. <laughs> How long have you guys had cameras in any of your parks? Oh, wow. Um, I don't have an exact um, period of time, but certainly 20 years. Okay. Yeah, back 20 years. So I know you can't speak to how many criminal acts were deterred from it because right. obviously it didn't happen, so we can't measure that. It would be interesting to know, let's say in the past two years, mm -hmm. how many crimes have been solved because of the camera footage that we have available to us. Okay. That would be helpful. And that's all. I'm, I'm all for giving as much money to parks as possible. I'll go on record as saying that because I think you're grossly underfunded and you do a lot. There's no word. There, there should be a better word for a lot, mm -hmm. but you do a lot. <laughs> and uh, you need all the help you can get. So if, if, any, if nobody else has any... Oh, okay. Thank you for acknowledging our department and our teammates. We appreciate your support. Representative Love. Thank you, Director Odom, for your presentation. You and I actually had a visit at Hadley Park did. not too long ago, specifically looking at that high brush area yeah. that became troublesome for residents trying to walk around the park yes. and trying to enter the community center. Yes. And you described the fact that uh, several times people had to um, flee from some foxes and skunks uh, you know, getting them caught off guard coming out um, and also having issues of safety. Right. Because the brush was just so high that it, it could not be contained uh, in, in a normal manner. So is part of this uh, going to be used to kind of keep that area maintained also if it's approved? It absolutely will be. You're, you're talking about, thank you for um, bringing that up, our visit. Um, you're talking about, in particular with Hadley, the riparian zones that are there. They serve a stormwater purpose, but yes, they had become grossly overgrown. Um, and we did um, use equipment similar to this uh, to get those cut down. So yes, we would be able to maintain other areas um, in the park system, not just Hadley, um, to, to maintain those riparian zone areas. And I, I know there are concerns about homeless encampments, uh, but I will offer this support for the use of cameras also. Hadley Park is so close to Tennessee State University mm -hmm. that I know oftentimes when students are trying to walk down through Hadley, sometimes, unfortunately, when it's not well lit, uh, or trying to walk down that strip of, of John A. Merritt, I have concerns about issues that may occur uh, with, with persons with ill intent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my hope would be that even though it's being used to kind of keep out other folks, uh, that maybe even there's some deterrent of criminal activity going on in that area. Thank yeah. you. 
Thank you. I, I'm not sure if we're ready to to make a motion to support this okay. uh, this request. I but so. if we are, I think I'm ready to make a motion, okay. and I'd like to uh, lead uh, this this legislation. Okay. I hear a second. All in favor? Uh, I have a question. Oh, let me get your mic. Do I need to abstain from this, being we have leases together? And by the way, I support it, I'd vote for it, and it is underfunded and you do an incredible job. And thank, thank you. you for our visits, and sorry about canceling our meeting yesterday. But, <laughs> so I'm getting it all out now, true confessions. But I, I think I should abstain okay. once Margaret says yes. Uh, you, I don't, do your leases provide you with any sort of financial incentive to approve this or uh, to? Uh, no, I just hope goodwill. I just always say, <laughs> when in doubt. You need to, but if you yeah. feel like you should, then that's fine. Okay, so we do have a motion. I have a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And we have one abstention. <laughs> Two, okay. You get your name special in the minutes now. All the other time. <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh, hold on. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and Monique, I do want to thank you for being here. I, I agree. Parks are under underfunded. I just, there's some things I just can't get over. Uh, but I, I know that uh, Sarah Finley had brought it up in the committee before about the idea of putting more money into public spaces and and more green space. Uh, and so if you all are interested in that and want to come back to us or send something over, I, I think that several of us would actually want to see that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you for that. Director Odom, thank you. And again, thank you for waiting. <laughs> um, we're gonna come back to the city's emergency response. And I wanna, I'll answer a couple of the questions that I think were already posed, um, which was about just like other PPE, even back into sanitization and other supplies. What happened is when we asked the departments for all of their specific requests related to COVID and items that they need additional funding for from ARP, this is what we're now bringing before you. So in some cases, even with, um, we talked about this with fire and OEM. That wasn't their entire list. That was what you've heard over the past couple of meetings were the ones that were the most urgent um, and, and emergency type needs. And so we did hear from, um, and you can see the departments listed that said, hey, we need to make some more PPE purchases. Could we use ARP funds for that? So we were starting to get more of those requests. We are still using the end of the um, the CARES Act fund, so our coronavirus relief fund, just for a, a bit of a um, kind of a recap. The last piece of that um, was a $20 million reserve for the city's emergency response. Um, we, that is not depleted to zero. Um, it got pretty low. And then we actually have an opportunity with some new health department grant funds that the health department may go back and pull some of the expenses that they've charged to that reserve fund to um, an ELC grant. So that fund is still a bit in flux. And, and that's actually a good thing. I just want everybody to know it's not that it's at zero and it isn't that we don't, um, that we're not paying attention to it or that I can't keep track of it. It's just that it's in flux because we now have funding from a health department grant that we didn't know when we set that reserve. We continue to file claims with FEMA to optimize those dollars. So as we get approval on FEMA, we take things out of that reserve, we take them out of the original COVID fund, and then the replacement, if you remember, is public safety salary. So we don't have to do that. We could come back to council and say, we no longer have to use these funds for what they were initially appropriated we want to reappropriate them for X, Y, or Z. We just want to wait until we know what that number is. 
And um, with all of our FEMA filing and the new grant, that, that reserve still exists. But keep in mind, those are our most flexible dollars. Those are actually not considered federal funds anymore because we spent the federal funds on the public safety salary. So as these additional requests are coming in, we could take this 900,000 and charge it to that COVID reserve. But I think it's really important for us to establish another reserve for the city to use in its emergency response. Just as you heard um, Chief Swan saying that things still come up. I might get a call to say, hey, we had damage at one of the tents, can we get a new tent? Or we had a fence break this or something at one of our testing sites um, and, you know, and vaccination sites. Um, so things come up and it's nice to be able to say, yes, we have that reserve. We haven't really been approving additional or new type of expenses to the other reserve because it had dwindled. So um, the 10 million is simply an estimate. If you remember historically, we had about, we had 68 million, we had 48 and then we added that other 20. 40 seems to, or um, 10 million, we, we don't think that that's gonna be the total we need, but we don't know how long we keep in some of these testing modes and vaccine modes. We don't know how long we'll prov be providing some of the services, um, some you know remote work. Um, we still get, thing, get requests from some of the departments. So um, Council Member Johnston, um, you're right that 375 seems to be part of this type of bucket. That was a specific request for social services. It's possible we could combine them. I think what we would wanna do is leave that one as a specific, but know that by creating this reserve, any overrun, since that is an estimate for 55 nights, you know, if we end up with 65 nights, we don't have to go back um, to that specific request then and increase it. Um, but that was a great catch. I think, you know, if we really had specific, specific details, we probably could get to that. Um, but the idea is that we can continue to provide um, services, supplies, equipment, some of the miscellaneous items that tend to add up for all of the departments. Um, the, we listed the primary users. It's not limited to, um, but those were the primary users of the reserve um, over the, the existing response at this point. So um, I would actually say, so when I saw the department requests, I would just do the 10,000 and include the 900 in it. I wouldn't do the 902,000 plus 10 million. That was the whole idea of establishing the reserve at 10 million so that we could have these types of department expenses and as they came through, they could just use those funds. Um, I don't know that I like that so much because I feel like we're creating a slush fund that then doesn't have as much oversight. And I know it says it'd be limited to expenditures on vaccinations and this, that, and the other. Uh, I just, we're, we've got so much money left right now. We're just in the very early stages of allocating what's going to end up being 300, whatever million. Um, I, I don't mind the 902. I just, um... I think that establishing a reserve fund this early on that, again, would be used as a slush fund of this, that, and the other, I just, to me, I don't, I don't like it. Um, if we were a year from now, when you, we, we're coming down to the wire, then I would see, hey, let's go ahead and set this aside because we don't know what's going to happen, this, that, and the other, but I just would rather keep, keep more oversight on that type of stuff. Um, if you want to have a reserve of 1 million, you know, 10 million, I think right now is just too early to be that, to have that large of a slush fund that we have allocated. So we have no more oversight on it. It's just not necessary at this point. Okay. And I would say that I can bring you, I can send you, you know, monthly reports on what is charged to it. So you would, you would have an idea of what is charged to it. That's historical reporting and not us approving it. I, I hear you. No, I, I appreciate the point. Councilwoman Gamble. Thank you. And, and actually, I, I agree with Councilmember Johnston that I, I think it's a little early to be looking at a reserve fund at this point. I, we probably will need one. 
but at this point, and while we're, we really haven't even touched the surface of the community needs yet, I think it's a little early to set aside 10 million. My question is, what, is the 902 separate? So there's two separate asks, it's the 902 and, and then the 10 million, yes. not all together. Correct. So the 902 was specifically requested by the departments that you see listed. Okay. What experience has shown us is that at some point, the other departments, many the other ones that are listed down below, are going to call and say, hey, I need to order more PPE. Where do I charge that? Hey, I need to order some additional, um, you know, sanitization, or I've had um, some barriers from the public that I need to put back up or people are, are going to call and ask, where do I charge that? Are these numbers uh, based on a time period? I mean, where, where did these uh, request figures come from? I mean, just to, to try to anticipate when they might run out and need these more. These numbers were for the, um, for the rest of this fiscal year. Okay. So just through uh, June, June 30th, 30th mm -hmm. so half a year. So it, can we look at then maybe a full year? A funding to cover that and then if they don't need it we can get it back yeah, as opposed to absolutely and I just wanted to clarify one thing if this makes a difference when we say reserve the idea of establishing this fund now maybe I regret the word reserve <laughs> because it's not that we're parking it because we're not sure if we this is actually what we need now um, I mean, if we were going to establish something that we just would estimate for the, you know, through 12, 31, 24, we would, it would be much higher. This was the idea of what do we need now? Now, I don't think in the next six months we're going to go through that level of a reserve unless we saw some crazy spike in new variant. So we certainly could um, establish this much lower. I mean, if we wanted to say, let's provide the departments with the 902 and put one more million available for other departments and just keep that monitored, it's likely we'd have to come back um, in the next six months to increase that one million, but we can certainly come back to you and do that. That's more than reasonable. Okay. So I would make a motion to increase the 902-340 ask through the end of uh, FY22 to an even million and table the 10 million reserve at this time. That gives almost $100,000 of a buffer for other departments to come through. And if all of a sudden all these other departments are coming, then we can deal with that at that point. Um, but I think a t basically a 10% buffer for the rest of the year um, for, for these departments and, and, and other, I think, is plenty at this point. And, and I would like to table the $10 million reserve, but, in but increase to a million dollars even uh, for a COVID emergency response requests. Okay, so you didn't have a question, just want a second. Okay, so we've got a motion for a $1 million total reserve. Um, now, this gets into kind of when we actually lay it out into a resolution. Um, there's a difference between appropriating the specific amount to these departments or just creating 1 million, which in, and just in functionality then, what it would tell me is um, that these departments would have a place to charge expenses on an as needed basis. And I would just continue to monitor that on a month to month. So uh, we wouldn't actually put the 350 in each of like in the sheriff's office. Um, right. Is that yeah, consistent so, with the way? You yeah. So like it's an, it's that? a 902, 300, 902,340 allocation to the different departments and then creating basically your reserve that you're asking. I was, I was suggesting the, the opposite, the opposite okay. that, that it become a $1 million reserve so that, and then all these different, like, so in dot at 153,006 would come in and just pull from that million dollar. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yep. That works for me. Yeah. It's a little bit more about allocating a specific budget to those departments versus saying I, I wouldn't be going to um, general services and saying, hey, spend all 105000 It would be charges you need it 
you know, kind of monitor month by month and then come back when we exceed that total. As we get close to exceeding the total, not when it's an emergency, but. So just when we write the resolution, Margaret, it will look a little different than allocating to those specific departments, I think. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. So I had a motion for the $1 million reserve for city response, um, keeping in mind the, the departments that have made the specific request. A second. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you for that. Um, then that brings us through um, the department requests. We are starting to look ahead for next month. Um, you'll hear more department requests um, along the lines of some of the um, HVAC and, um, and building needs um, as we continue to serve the public and the public and Metro employees come through these buildings and we'll work on those. Again, what I'd like to do is get you this kind of level description ahead of time, just to try to keep things moving. Um, the other thing that I would like to do, and I talked to Margaret about this a little bit, um, we would like to start to move into kind of that community engagement and start to give you some of the information that we know is out there and seek more information. One of the things that we think is really helpful, um, in fact, um, uh, Renee Pratt with Social Services, her team does a community needs assessment and has uh, um, a depth of data about Davidson County and all sorts of different information about um, homelessness, literacy rates, availability of childcare, you know, um, poverty, uh, you just all, I mean, really kind of a, a really deep and much broader look at our community. And, um, I saw the presentation a bit abbreviated, probably in about 20 to 30 minutes. I think if she had the opportunity to expand it to 35 or 40, that would be great. Rather than doing that here, I am going to see if we can do that on a WebEx outside of our normal meeting time. Um, we may even do it as a recording so that, unfortunately, it doesn't create a question and answer opportunity but it would give you a lot of the information. And if you were all willing to either do that outside of our normally recurred meeting, either on a WebEx where we're all on it with the public or on a recording that we would share on our website and ask you all so that then we can start to get some of that really critical information and data in your hands, but try to keep the meetings moving just so that we don't have to take up that much time if we could do it ahead of time. Would you all be willing to do something like that? I have to figure out what works best from a legal perspective since we have to have open meetings. But um, I think either way, the downside is we won't have a Q&A, but the upside is you can get a lot of really good content and we don't have to do it during this forum um, so that we can keep recommendations coming through and we can start to build up this community knowledge um, and engagement. So. There is still a plan to do a survey through the hub. There is still a plan to possibly work with um, some of the nonprofits either collectively or through a more organized approach where we can find out what they've been seeing. And that collectively will become kind of our, our needs assessment. Would there be anything that we'd be missing that I haven't mentioned that we should be considering Filed, late filed for the October 19th, first meeting. first meeting of November. Yeah, so that will give us the time. So thank you again for saying that. What we'll do is obviously some of the resolutions are pretty straightforward. They're purchases. Wherever there's more of a program, we'll make sure that we're discussing if it's a predefined contract, it'll be in there. If it's not been somebody who's been identified, that contract will have to come back to council in addition to the resolution. Um, and then we'll get that drafted and I'll work with the sponsors just to make sure. I don't think there was a lot that we missed in the meeting, so I don't think anybody would be surprised to see it. If we think of something after the fact, we'll bring it back to the whole committee. Um, 
and then so that will be we'll do them as four separate resolutions. Are we still going to have the platform on the hub for people's input? I, I'm glad we'll have Renee. Uh, can we get an update on yes. that at the next meeting? Yes, yeah, so we'll have Renee. So the the idea of bringing together all of the kind of community information engagement would be to still have something on the hub, hear from nonprofits either collectively, if I can, I haven't contacted them, but if I can contact CNM to see if they've already done that type. We want to hear from our nonprofit community. We want to hear from individuals, which will be through the hub, and then also Renee's group. And that collectively will give us kind of that, that look. Um, and then Representative Love, if I can put you on the spot for maybe the next meeting. Um, I just saw the, um, the finance group put out kind of a framework that the state um, was looking at with their ARP funds. And if there is anything that may trickle down or be an application, so we're already aware of like water and sewer, um, funding will be available for us to apply. Um, I believe we've already applied with the Tennessee Arts, um, but there's a few other areas that if I could ask you for a state update at the next meeting, or if it doesn't meet your calendar, December, but just uh, we are November, Ninth, I want to say, but that might not be right. November 10th. I'll give you the microphone. Hold on. I just heard it was. Right. <laughs> I've been late uh, these meetings. I have a class I teach at Fisk on Wednesdays at the same time, but I'll make it over here as soon as I can and get an update. That would be fantastic. Okay. I appreciate that. I've had a couple other questions. Folks have been asking like, well, what about the state? And some of it we can apply for. Sure. Not much of it is a direct allocation that's just gonna come our way. Um, but I think that might be helpful for this group and then for those that have been tuning in, so. Yeah, and, and there will be some general things that other citizens can apply for also that we're sending money down for. Okay, I think um, that's really helpful. I was me. able, I hope it stays in, but I was able to get 10 million in the budget for uh, violence interrupter programs. And so hope that stays in. Excellent. It'll be statewide, but hopefully it stays in, we'll see. Okay, I appreciate that. Yes. Any other business questions, requests? Joe, I don't know if it's normal for everyone to ask to sponsor, but nobody signed up to sponsor the Fuse Corps. Oh, you're right. The, yeah. the fellows, yeah. the Fuse Corps, that was you. Okay, I didn't write that down. The fellows. The fellows, oh, the oh. Fuse Corps. Yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> Did I miss that? Was that you? Were you? No, I was just uh, volunteering. To She's oh, you volunteer. are volunteering. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. You're right on that one. Council Microphone, just so I can, I'm not sure I heard it. Sorry. Uh, okay. can, can we have the council members added to the legislation? It's up for the ones we abstained on, obviously. Um, I was missing from... Uh, being listed as a sponsor at the last meeting. Okay, thank you, and I apologize for that. Okay, I believe we are officially adjourned. Thank you all very much. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.